American Catholic History is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Hello and welcome to American Catholic History. If you like our podcast, be sure to rate us and give us a review wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Noelle Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. Today we're talking about Simon Brute, immigrant, professor, and the first bishop of Vincennes, Indiana. Now that resume doesn't sound all that exciting. He was a very simple and humble man. But his life and impact are anything but simple and humble. Yeah, President John Quincy Adams, a fairly well-educated man himself, said that Brute was the most learned man of his day in America. Brute was a bit of a paradox. Simplicity and simply doing what he believed God desired him to do seemed to have been the hallmarks of his life, and that resulted in some very remarkable things. He's another one who was born in France, but unlike a number of the priests and religious we've talked about thus far, he didn't come to America to escape the bloodletting of the French Revolution. Right. He was born in 1779, so he was only 10 when the revolution began. But he did grow up within the context of the French Revolution, a fact which most certainly had an impact on him. So let's look at those details of his birth and upbringing. Simon Gabriel Brute de Remor was born on March 20th, 1779 in Rennes, which is the capital of Brittany in northwest France. His father was the head of the royal provincial government in that region, and his mother descended from aristocracy, so he had a very well-placed birth. His father, unfortunately, died when he was just six. His mother set up a printer's shop to support the family, her family had been printers to the king, and little Simon learned how to work in the printer's shop. He said he never liked that work, but considering his vast library later in life, it seems being around a print shop had some influence on him. The library was also connected to his intellectual aptitude. From an early age, he excelled in academics, but his studies were interrupted by the great upheaval that was the French Revolution. During the Revolution, thousands of priests and religious were executed for refusing to renounce the Catholic faith, and Simon witnessed these brutal executions more than once. His mother, who was a devout Catholic, would actually assist in hiding priests from the authorities. Simon would go to the local prison where priests and religious were being held. He and a priest would go to the prison disguised as a baker and a baker's assistant, and they befriended the guards. Simon and this priest would bring bread to the prisoners, as well as the Blessed Sacrament, and the priest would hear confessions. When the insanity of the revolution simmered down and the schools reopened, Simon went to medical school in Paris, but not without his mother's very interested involvement. She was determined that her son, whom she had raised in the faith and had high hopes for great success, would not be lost to the allurements of the world he would meet in Paris. She gave him very strict instructions on how he was to act and things he should and should not do while in Paris to protect his faith. Apparently, her influence was strong because he remained faithful and then some. While at medical school, he and a small group of Catholic friends banded together for mutual support. They all experienced anti-Catholic harangues from fellow students as well as from professors. They would defend the faith and choose term paper topics that enabled them to make the case for Catholicism. Their professors and fellow students didn't appreciate it, but Brute and his fellow Catholics who engaged in this little counter-rebellion were such good students and were so good at presenting their arguments that their opponents could do little but get angry. One instance of this back and forth actually caused a sensation that got beyond the walls of the medical school. It made it all the way to the ears of Napoleon Bonaparte, who at the time was the first consul of France. Napoleon caught wind of the anti-Catholic shenanigans of the professors, and since he was intent on seeing things stay calm, he ordered the professors to stick to their subjects and drop the anti-Catholic stuff. And with that, the name and reputation of Simon Gabriel Brute was in the ears of the future emperor of the French. In 1803, Brute graduated from medical school at the top of his class, which pleased his mother. And he did so while maintaining his virtue and his faith, which pleased her even more. Initially, he went back to Rennes and offered his medical services free of charge to all who needed them. And he was offered a very distinguished medical position in Paris, which further pleased mother. 
But Simon had a shock in store for her and for his friends. He was going to forego his very promising medical career and enter seminary to become a Catholic priest. His mother was not pleased. It wasn't that she didn't respect the priesthood, of course, but she desired the prestigious and comfortable life of a medical doctor for her son. Also, she had hoped that Simon would be able to help pay for his younger brother, Augustine, to go to medical school. But Simon had made up his mind. He truly believed that God desired him to be a priest, so he enrolled in the seminary of Saint-Sulpice in Paris in 1803. While at Saint-Sulpice, his connection to Napoleon resurfaced when Napoleon appointed Simon the Master of Ceremonies to the Archbishop of Paris. The position came with a stipend, so Simon was able to help pay for his brother's medical training after all. It was also while at Saint-Sulpice that he began to accumulate his considerable library and his interest in becoming a missionary began. For her part, his mother still held out hopes that he would abandon priestly studies and resume his promising medical career. She even tried to get the superior of the Sulpicians to press Simon to leave seminary, but the superior, Father Jacques-André Emery, reminded her that the life of a good and holy priest was even more valuable to the world than that of an excellent man of medicine. And Simon was resolved to be a good and holy priest. He certainly was a capable student, but a nephew quoted him as insisting, I did not come to the seminary to be a scholar, but to be a saint. Uh, Potentially very prophetic words. He graduated and was ordained in 1808, and this occasioned the final sacrifices that his mother could make. First, in 1804, Napoleon Bonaparte had been proclaimed and crowned the Emperor of the French, and he offered Brute a position in the Imperial Chapel. But Father Brute declined the position. He had set his heart on missionary work. Much to his mother's chagrin, he desired a life of simplicity and hardship, far from the salons and brilliant architecture of Paris. His missionary ship came in, literally, in 1809, when the Sulpician father, Benedict Flaget, came to Paris from the new United States. Now there's an ironic twist here. Father Flaget was a fellow Sulpician who had been a professor at Saint-Sulpice, but had to flee to America due to the French Revolution. He'd served as a missionary in America, particularly in the Northwest Territory near a town named Vincennes, but he dreamed of returning to seminary work. He was assigned to be a professor at Georgetown, and then in 1808, he was named the first bishop of the new diocese of Bardstown. That would mean going back to missionary work full-time. He came to Paris to protest this appointment. Father Brute, on the other hand, was inspired by Father Flaget's story of missionary work, and so when Father Flaget returned to the United States in the fall of 1810 to become Bishop of Bardstown, his protestations were unsuccessful, Father Brute accompanied him. The ironic twist here is that while Father Flaget, who desired seminary work, was consecrated bishop and then went west to be the missionary bishop of his vast diocese, Father Brute, who desired missionary work, was kept in Baltimore and assigned to teach at St. Mary's Seminary, the first seminary established in the United States. He was disappointed, but he was obedient, and he would eventually get his missionary work. And one quick side note, the log cabin that Bishop Flaget lived in for a time in Bardstown is still there, and we're actually going to visit it with a group of awesome people on a pilgrimage to the Kentucky Holy Land and Bourbon Country. Uh, you guys all should come join us. Get information at pilgrimages.com slash Catholic Kentucky Bourbon, and we'll link to it in our show notes. Father Simon Brute taught at St. Mary's for two years and then was moved to the other seminary that the Sulpicians ran at the time, Mount St. Mary's, in the tiny Catholic enclave of Emmitsburg, Maryland. And it was at the Mount where he really started to have his major impact on the American church. Absolutely. First, while St. Mary's in Baltimore more or less trained priests for Baltimore and the other dioceses along the East Coast, Mount St. Mary's was more of the seminary for missionary priests who would go west. Second, his abilities as a professor formed the seminarians exceptionally well. Third, his life of prayer, humility, and simplicity made him a model for the seminarians to emulate, and he was a valued spiritual director. And all this meant that while he wasn't out in the mission field himself, he was having a real and important impact on many priests who would go out to be missionaries. And fourth, he was an excellent aide to both major figures who were already there in Emmitsburg, Father John Dubois, the founder and first president of Mount St. Mary's, and especially to Mother Elizabeth Ann Seton, who was building up her new religious order, the Sisters of Charity of St. Joseph. 
We've actually done episodes on both of them, John Dubois in episode 39 and Mother Seton in episode 78. Father Rute and Mother Seton recognized in each other a kindred spirit very quickly. He became her spiritual director and chaplain to her order, and in turn she taught him English, and she also provided a calming influence on his restless spirit. She helped him see that if God wanted him to be a missionary in a far-off field, God would make the arrangements. But for now, it was good for him to be content with the missionary work in Maryland. He struggled mightily with those two things, English and his zeal for missionary work. In regards to English, he would learn how to read and write, but he never came to be fully conversant. And regarding missionary work, he would come to love his little missionary field in Emmitsburg, and he would eventually find a larger field further west. In 1815, he returned to France for a few reasons. First, to retrieve his vast library, which he'd been sorely missing. When it came over, it was quickly recognized as the largest and finest personal library in the country, containing 5,000 volumes on all manner of subjects. Second, he went to attend to his mother, whose health was failing, but who was in the capable hands of her younger son, Augustine, who had, after all, become an excellent physician. And third, to see about bringing back priests for the work of the missions. Upon his return in November of 1815, he found that his Sulpician superiors had decided to make him president of St. Mary's in Baltimore, so he reluctantly stayed in Baltimore in this position for a little over two years. He and Mother Seton continued to exchange letters, and it was clear that he longed to return to the Mount. He got his wish in 1818, and he would remain in Emmitsburg for the next 16 years. During this time in Emmitsburg, he became an indispensable churchman. His reputation as an excellent professor and valued pastor and spiritual mentor only grew. His notes about his days included rising very early, praying for an hour or so, taking the Blessed Sacrament to the sick, anointing the dying, having lots of conversations with as many as 62 different people, offering Mass, and walking up to 30 miles in a day. His notes one day conclude with the words, How wonderful the day of a priest! It wasn't quite the Wild West which at the time was Indiana, not Texas or New Mexico. But Western Maryland was rural and sparse enough. This was missionary work. He also became a sought-after consultor on theological matters, and when the American bishops met in council in Baltimore, he was relied upon for his insights. His time in Emmitsburg had its low points as well. He suffered the loss of his closest spiritual friend, Mother Seton, who died in 1821, and then of Father Dubois, who was named the third bishop of New York in 1826. When Mother Seton died, he wrote of her, Oh, such a mother, such faith and love, such a spirit of true prayer, of true humility, of true self-denial in all, of true charity to all. But mark well that even our love for one another, all, all in this world is vanity, except it be for God, of God, in God, for eternity, for God and eternity, all in all, and indeed to live for this, to live for heaven, is at the same time to lead the happiest life upon earth. Is it not so, O mother? Answer from your little wood. Pray now and then for me. Father Brute would continue his duties at Mount St. Mary's and in the community around Emmitsburg. He also carried on a significant correspondence with bishops and non-cleric figures all over the United States. It was during this time that President John Quincy Adams referred to him as the most learned man of his day in the United States. He carried on this tranquil life until his tranquility was broken in 1834. That's when he found out that his name had been submitted to the Vatican to be the first bishop of the new diocese of Vincennes in Indiana. He was terrified of the idea of being made bishop of the new diocese. He wrote to every Western bishop he knew pleading for a reprieve. He said he was prematurely old at 54 and his health had started to decline. He pointed out that his English was still not good and he was not one for public appearances preferring his books and a quiet place to read, or the company of the Daughters of Charity, to hobnobbing functions. All of his protests were in vain, however, and, like Bishop Flaget before him, he accepted his fate and set off for St. Louis, where he would be consecrated by Bishop Joseph Rosati. 
Now, we've talked about Vincennes a few times before, particularly in episode 37 when we talked about Father Pierre Jabot, who aided General George Rogers Clark to defeat the British in the Western theater of the Revolutionary War. Yes, Vincennes figures in early American Catholic history quite a bit. It started out as a French fort, and Father Jabot was active in and around it before the Revolution. He left Vincennes in the 1790s. For three years, Vincennes was without a priest until a missionary came for a time, and that missionary was Father Benedict Flaget. When Father Flaget became Bishop Flaget of Bardstown, Vincennes was just one city in his diocese which covered the entire United States between the Appalachians and the Mississippi River. Now, in 1834, the elderly Bishop Flaget was going to be co-consecrator for the new Bishop of Vincennes, and it was a priest whom he had brought over to America 24 years earlier. So like many things in American Catholic history, it all comes full circle. It is a small Catholic world. Bishop Brute was consecrated bishop and went to his new sea city in 1834, immediately setting to work. When he arrived in Vincennes, all he had was $240, which the Daughters of Charity had raised for him, and a gold watch, which had been a gift. He wasn't even able to bring his beloved library with him just yet. His vast diocese covered the entire state of Indiana and the eastern portion of Illinois, including Chicago. He only had three priests, and one of them was on loan from St. Louis. His new cathedral, St. Francis Xavier, had been under construction since 1826 and was still far from completion. There were no schools, and the general health of the faith was not great. So at long last, he finally had his wild mission field. In 1835, he did what so many other bishops before him had done in a similar situation. He went back to France to raise money and find priests for missionary work in his new diocese. He was very well received in Paris and his native Rennes. His words and humility inspired many hearts, and he was hailed as a living saint. Some even took threads from his cassock as relics. He managed to raise enough money to finish St. Francis Xavier Cathedral, complete with a bell tower on top of the structure, plus building many more parishes, schools, and other needed structures. And he came back with 12 seminarians and 8 priests. In another turn of things coming full circle, he found himself writing to mothers who, as his mother had, opposed their son's desires to set off for missionary work. He wrote to one, There are in yonder America souls waiting the generosity of a mother, whom the Lord will know full well how to console in the loneliness of her last moments. Among those priests to respond to the missionary call and return with him was Father Benjamin Petit. Father Petit would distinguish himself in short order by working among the Potawatomi Indians and then accompanying them on what came to be known as the Trail of Death. Learn more about that harrowing story in episode 48. Bishop Brute also sought religious women to come to establish schools. He managed to get the Daughters of Charity of Emmitsburg to send three sisters to join the two others from Kentucky, and he set one of his new priests to the task of finding a religious order back in France to send sisters over. This effort would bear fruit in 1840 when Mother Theodora Guerin came with five sisters from the Sisters of Providence. Mother Theodora Guerin would be canonized a saint in 2006. We'll certainly do an episode on her. But Bishop Brute would not live to see the Sisters of Providence arrive or the great growth that would come from his labors. He died on June 26, 1839 of tuberculosis. He had been bishop for all of five years, but they were five years of incredible growth. Three priests had become 25 with 20 seminarians. The seven parishes had grown to 27, with 30 other stations where the sacraments could be offered regularly. Two religious orders had been established, plus a college for young men and an academy for women. 130 youth were enrolled in parochial schools. His vast library was housed in a building specially built for it near the cathedral. The faith, which was moribund when he arrived, was now thriving. And it was because he had given every last ounce of himself, even attending to sick calls and filling in for his priests at far distant missions as his own death was nearing. Bishop Brute was buried under the altar of St. Francis Xavier Cathedral, but in one final example of humility, he was buried in borrowed clothes. His death was mourned throughout the church in America with the president of Mount St. Mary's in Emmitsburg giving a stirring talk on his sanctity and accomplishment later that year. In 1891, Cardinal Gibbons of Baltimore on a visit to Vincennes exclaimed, Worthy citizens of Vincennes, 
you need not go on pilgrimages to visit the tombs of saints. There is one reposing here in your midst, namely the saintly founder of this diocese, Right Reverend Simon Brute. Regarded as a living saint during his lifetime, his cause for canonization was opened in 2005. You've been listening to American Catholic History on the StarQuest Production Network. If you've been enjoying our podcast, please help us out by giving us a five-star rating and a good review. And we ask you to consider supporting the work of SQPN. Yes, now is a great time to become a StarQuest patron. Thanks to a generous gift from a StarQuest supporter, when you start a new Patreon monthly pledge at sqpn.com slash give, the first three months will be matched by an equal amount from our donor. So if you become a new patron at $10 per month, after three months, our donor will give $30 to StarQuest to support all of our shows, including American Catholic history, making your gift go even further. If you've been thinking of becoming a StarQuest patron, now is the time. Visit sqpn.com slash give today. To learn more about Bishop Simon Brute, to find previous episodes, or to learn about our upcoming pilgrimage to the Kentucky Holy Land and Bourbon Country, please visit sqpn.com slash history. We also love feedback and hearing about great Catholic history sites and stories from all over. You can email us at history at sqpn.com or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash American Catholic History, Instagram at ACH underscore podcast, or follow StarQuest on Twitter at SQPN. I'm Noelle Heaster Crow. And I'm Tom Crow. Thank you once again for joining us on American Catholic History on StarQuest.